Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So welcome everyone to another uh, Wednesday evening Clear Mountain Dhamma Reflections. Uh, this evening we'll continue our month's theme of the three characteristics. And uh, for the past two weeks, we've been going over the first two characteristics. That is the characteristic of uh, anicca or impermanence. Uh, the Buddha said that all things internal and external are impermanent the first characteristic. The second characteristic is dukkata. There's an element of uh, unsatisfactoriness in the personal experience and an element of constant churning or um, yeah, friction in the, in the external world of things. And the third characteristic, which we'll be looking into this evening, uh, is anatta, which is not self. And I thought that a nice way to explore this characteristic, which is probably the easiest to misunderstood, the perhaps the most difficult to actually feel and experience, is to actually uh, take us into a, uh, a meditative appreciation of this, or at least a meditative inquiry of this uh, aspect of anatta. And uh, as we have been doing, we've been exploring the book Buddha Dhamma by P.A. Payuto. That's this book here, very thick book. Uh, and the section that we'll be going over tonight uh, is a mention of six um, sc scriptural explanations of anatta. It's on page uh, 126 uh, of the three characteristics chapter, the third chapter in the section on anatta, on not self. And uh, P.A. Paiuto, the author, goes into six different uh, words which are used to explain anatta, not self. And what we'll try to do here this evening is to uh, get an internal feel for those six uh, six attributes or six uh, characteristics of not self. So this will be both a scriptural meditation and a uh, internal, very meditative uh, exploration. So to begin with, uh, what I'd like to ask if people are willing to explore is what we can call the cloud body. So what I mean by this is a uh, first person uh, interoceptive or feeling from the inside appreciation of the whole body. So many teachers, Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn Jayasaro, uh, Bhante Nalio will recommend taking your whole body as your meditation object. So from the soles of the feet, you can wiggle your toes, you're actually feeling them, to the top of your head, and everything in between, feeling the whole, this whole body internally. But what the cloud body, uh, what, what we're suggesting by that, is actually even a bit broader than just the, our physical felt sense of the body, but even um, the, extremity of the body in terms of our felt sense of where skin or body becomes air. So when you feel the body internally, and you can do this, uh, initially it's perhaps most easy to appreciate if you have your eyes closed. But with your eyes closed, if you try to find the limits of the skin, you'll find this liminal or both internal and external neither internal nor external, kind of in-between cloud-like feeling around the body. It's not a clear, we don't have a, a hard shell of the skin when we feel the body from the inside. So that's what we're calling the cloud body, and it's an interesting place to meditate from uh, because it's broad, so you can do it at any time of the day. You can do it with your eyes open because it's so broad, the mind wanders off and you can really just return to any uh, internal appreciation of uh, 
this felt sense of the body, this, this cloud body. But the bigger we can appreciate it, the better. So knowing the whole body, the whole felt sense of the body, and it's uh, this vague form that it feels like from the inside, this uh, almost misty or uh, you know, the, the lines are blurred between what's internal and external when we feel the body from the inside this way. And it's interesting because when we feel the body this way, when we know the body in this, in this aspect, we can actually appreciate all five of the khanda, all five of the aggregates. These are the aspects which um, the Buddha kind of broke down the, the person into. You can feel form. I can feel the whole body from the top of the head to the soles of the feet. I can feel feeling, the second aggregate, so pleasant, painful, and neutral. Feel those through the whole body. Pleasant, painful, pleasant feelings here. Maybe some irritation here, some, uh, maybe some hotness over here or the touch of uh, cloth over here. You can experience perception from this cloud body. Uh, the shift of perception, what is inside, what is outside. Uh, all of that is, it's quite uh, yet liminal or uh, you know, really on the on the razor's edge. You know, you could you could say it's internal or it's external. Uh, you experience formations, specifically the formation or sankara, the fourth aggregate of uh, sati or mindfulness. This is a, an application of mind. We're paying attention to this uh, this blurry felt internal sense of the body, and then consciousness. That's what we're we're knowing it from. So with this base of the cloud body, we can jump into uh, our exploration of the anatta. So the first uh, aspect or the first way that the Buddha talked about uh, not self or that it's explained in the, the commentaries and in various texts is that it is a samiko, that there is no owner. So a interesting and useful way to explore these from this embodied, felt matrix, you could even almost call it, is to ask questions. So with each of these uh, explorations, we'll have a different uh, question word. So this is our first uh, exploration, asamiko. This is who. So who is the owner? Uh, sami is the Sanskrit and Pali word for an owner, whereas this body, this mind, this feeling all of the thoughts in the body, the consciousness, who is the owner of this? So feeling the body from the inside, and you can just drop this question into your awareness of the experience. Like, who is the owner of this? And what is it, what would it even mean to have an owner? Can I really say that I'm the owner of my body in an, an ultimate sense? Do I really own my feelings? If I did, I, I think that I would just get rid of all the painful ones and just keep all the, the pleasant ones. I would just relinquish my ownership of negative feelings, but that's not how it works. So who is, who is the owner? And this is a, asking questions like this is a, a good way to explore anatta uh, because if you take it from a doctrinal stance of the Buddha saying, or you know, if you're not totally down with whatever the Buddha said, somebody tells you, the Buddha said, everything is not self. You might just be able to point to so many things like that doesn't make sense for this reason. I feel the self, you know, I've always, known I'm Kovilo or I'm whatever, you know, I'm a man, I'm a monk, all these labels that we have, but uh, what is the ownership of these things? The second question that we can drop into our, our pool of this cloud body or this even, you can think of an oceanic body, this uh, body which just feels like ripples, just feels like current, 
just different uh, densities of, of current. And you can ask the second question, which is, what, what control do we have? And the word that we're looking at here is avasavat tanato. So vasa is power or control. And what's being pointed to here is that there's a lack of control over all of this body and mind. Can, can we really control as we, you know, I feeling whole body, feeling sensations, perceptions, knowing it? Am I really in control of it? If I was in control of it, would I allow for pain again? Yeah. If I had full control, I would never exp experience pain. I would just say, uh, knees don't hurt. Being a monk, wanting to be a monk for the rest of my life, I would say, if I was in control, I would say, hair on the top of my head, never grow again. Just stop growing. If I had control of my perceptions, I would say, never perceive that another person is the, pro is the cause of my suffering. If I was in control of my consciousness, I would keep my consciousness big all the time. I would just set that on lock and just keep this broad, spacious consciousness all the time. But consciousness is not really under my control, and neither are the, any of the other aggregates or the sense bases, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. None of them, I don't have full control of them. The, my hearing is getting bad, and this is what happens when a body gets older, your eye start, eye start, starts going, we don't have ultimate control of our senses, and you can feel them in this way and look at them. What, what control do I really have? And just dropping that pebble into the, this ocean of awareness of the body. The third question that we can look at is where? Where is the center of the body? Uh, the Pali concept that this is being based on is sunyata or sunyato, that which is empty. Um, a elaboration of this concept of emptiness, sunyata, is there is no atasara. Sara is like the heartwood, the heartwood of a tree, the essence of a tree, the core, the pith, uh, the center, really. And there's no central self. Feeling this, there's there's nothing is it is it in the brain well no it's not in the brain you know i can feel my body from my hand or from my stomach uh, is the center in the heart that's even some there are some abhidhamma texts which abhidhamma commentaries would suggest that the heart is located the chitta is located in our actual heart organ I mean, certainly biologically, um, you know, there's no anatomist or any doctor, or any scientist who's ever found an essential soul or anything bound up like in some, you know, blood part or, you know, in some vein or artery of the, the heart. It just, it's not there. And similarly, our, our, our feeling, our internal felt sense of, of the heart, just not a center, it's, it's empty. So where, where is the center? If there was a self, I would suspect that there would be a center. I would be able to find the pith. I would be able to find my heartwood. Um, if at center, if at core, I was just a manifestation of loving kindness all the time, then why or how could I feel uh, aversion when aversion comes up? So what, where is the center? And when you're practicing this, this cloud body, again, whether you have your eyes open, your eyes closed, whether you're doing this in the midst of daily life or in, this, in the middle of a, a meditation sit, a longer formal meditation session, just like perfuming, perfuming consciousness with this, this question. And where? Where is the center? 
if there was a self, as I, I feel, you know, I feel like I've got a self, but where, where exactly is that self? I can't find it in the body. I certainly can't find it in, in feeling. Feeling is just constantly, you know, just take a very gross feeling, which uh, you can experience on the, the palms of your hand. There's no center. Even, even if you point to a particular spot on your hand or anywhere on your body and you try to feel that spot, there's no center. It's just you, it, the feeling is one of evanescence, a feeling of like a shower, a, uh, a shimmering. It's a feeling of shimmering and you can't point to a center. And this is certainly true even on an anatomical level. You go to uh, the physics of the body and uh, certainly in terms of the atoms of our body, there's much more empty space and that's the, the literal meaning of sunyata, emptiness. Uh, there's more emptiness than there is solidity. There's more space around the nucleus of an atom than there is nucleus. So, and even <laughs> you point, okay, so in the nucleus in this one cell in my heart or in my brain, if you're going to posit that, then uh, you can even pierce through a nucleus and see all the different uh, subatomic, um, sub-subatomic particles that are involved there. And uh, But just that's a bit uh, philosophical. You, For the most part, we can't actually feel that small. But this constant vibration, the vibratory nature of um, our hands and our, our skin, you know, is almost a metaphor for the vibratory nature of, of atoms. And you can think of it in that, that sense. Um, so yeah, where is the center? Just drop that question in. Our next question is when. So when is the self? The Pali that this is being derived from is yata pacheya pavatito. So pavatita is just, it, things move along. And what do they move along to? Yata pacheya. Pacheya are conditions, causes, um, causes and conditions. Yata as. So just as causes and conditions roll along, that's how we experience our body, our feelings, our perceptions, our mental formations, and our consciousness. So this shimmering, like interoceptive field of awareness that we're tapping into we can ask, if there was an eternal self somewhere in here, then we would suspect that there is no when. So the question when points to uh, a temporal existence of things, which means uh, a beginning and an end. There's a beginning and an end of things. And uh, if something has a cause and a condition, then it's not eternal, then it is temporal. So when is the self? When I can, just feeling the body, considering the body. The body was certainly born. And there was a time uh, before September 13th, 1982, when there was no Covilo, there was no little baby me kind of wandering around on the outside of a person's body. Um, similarly with, with all of you, there's a beginning and there'll be an end. The, the body passes away. Similarly with feelings and the, the mental, uh, all the mental characteristics are even more evanescent, even, even more transient, and they're even more temporal um, in the sense that we can, can feel them. So you can certainly feel this, um, you know, in any moment of the, the shimmering is implying a rising, passing away, this constant uh, humming of our skin, this uh, cloud, it's almost as if there's like a, a thunderstorm in this uh, felt embodied presence, just constant movement. And if you sit for anywhere longer than an hour or anywhere longer than you're, you're used to, you'll see this more and more, the uh, arising and passing away of feeling, certainly perceptions change. And if there were a permanent self, one would suspect that 
uh, there wouldn't be all of these temporal um, pointers. So when is the self dropping that into consciousness? Next question is, why do we take this as a whole? The Pali is Suddha Sankara Punjato. Punjato is a mass. It's a simile, or I'm sorry, a synonym for uh, kanda or aggregate. So this body and this mind are an aggregate. Suddha, which is pure, it's purely an aggregate or a heap or a conglomeration of Sankara, of conditioned things. So we're put together by parts, totally. There's no whole. And when you bring your attention to the body from the top of the head, or at least from the top of the, the cloud, from the top of the, um, this whirring, sensational nature at the top of the head, down to the base of, of the body, the base of the, the feet. Uh, we call this, uh, this is my whole body, but certainly the body is a conglomeration of parts. It's just put together from things. You can talk about it in terms of anatomical parts, you know, arms and legs and head and nose and eyes. You can talk about it in terms of system, the nervous systems, uh, skeletal system, muscular system, uh, nervous system, etc. cetera. Uh, you can talk about it in terms of physics, as we had mentioned. We've got the uh, electrons and neutrons and protons and gluons and quarks and whatever, and you could talk about it in a chemical sense. We've got oxygen and carbon, and um, but from the felt sense, it's just totally put together. Uh, and if there was a self, one would a self would imply just a uniformity, a, a wholeness of this, and you can't find it in the physicality. So in the rupa the first khanda, um, is there a wholeness of sensations or vedana, of feelings? No, you, you, and you can feel that. Uh, of perceptions, of sanya, it's not a whole. You know, it's just uh, perceptions arising, perceptions passing away, and uh, compiled. Even our perceptions especially are just a, a pile up, a pile on, of words and concepts which are based on memory and sights and sounds and smells and tastes and it's all just put together and glommed this is a good word which uh, Ajahn Jeff uses glom together and that's it's almost the word means as you would guess it's like basically silly putty just uh, different things glued together or amalgamed you know come together um, in in what we feel to be this um, heap of body and perceptions, but they're just made up of all sorts of different things. And even consciousness is also put together from, um, yeah, our, our state of mind, our ability to uh, appreciate different things. If uh, we were blind or if we were deaf, our perception, uh, our, um, our consciousness of the visual field, of the auditory field, would be very different. Um, and again, see if you can feel that and drop this question, why do we take this as a whole? Just letting that reverberate. It's as if you ring a bell with the question, why, why do I take anything here in this body and mind? Why do I take it as a whole? And just let that, let that ring. The final question which we'll be investigating as we feel this uh, kinesthetic, this uh, blurry body, this, this uh, cloud body. Our last question is, how could a permanent self exist? The Pali is Atta Patikepato. So uh, Patikepato means the opposite or in opposition to Atta. Uh, everything that we experience, the, the flow of body, the flow of feelings, of perceptions, of mental formations, of consciousness, that flow is in itself a, uh, a contradiction of permanence. 
how could a permanent self exist? If there was anything that was permanent, it would be, I guess, uh, it'd be like a simile is, it'd be like Thor's hammer. Yeah. Um, Thor's hammer can basically just, just crush through anything, you know, and uh, that's, if the body were self, then yeah. If the body was a permanent and whole thing, then you would assume it would just be able to cut space and cut physicality and just crush through anything and um, nothing could could stop it. The, it, the, the idea of a, a permanent self, certainly on the level of form, just is, um, it breaks, it breaks physics. And on the level of feeling, similarly, because that's based on uh, the body, it's based on biology, it's based on uh, chemical elements and uh, physics. And perceptions, mental formations, consciousness uh, are similarly. Uh, how could we experience any change in any of these if there was permanence? So uh, just dropping this question into our, our pool, our cool pool of the body, knowing the cloud body and asking how, how could a permanent self exist in this, this felt appreciation? So, so yeah, that was a, a big tour. And just to, to recap, so these are six scriptural meditative inquiries into anatta or not self uh, from Pihipayuto's Buddha Dhamma uh, in the scriptural explanation of anatta. And we were practicing from cloud body and feeling who is the owner, Asamikato, asking these questions. If, if the mind is ready to ask questions, if the mind is quiet, you can throw any of these questions in there and just to, to shake things up. Because really most of us, most of the time, are operating from a, a position of self. And when we take that position, we're implying an other. And when we have self and other, uh, yeah, it can, we can use it skillfully, but we can also use it very unskillfully. So learning how not to be addicted and attached to having to posit a self is what these questions are looking at. So who is the owner? What control do we have? Asavatanato. Where is the center of this body? When is the self? What are the causes and conditions of it? Why do we take this as a whole? And how could a permanent self exist? Who, what, where, when, why, and how? So uh, I hope everyone was able to um, get something out of that. And yeah, now we can open things up to questions and people can type in questions in uh, the chat on YouTube and I believe possibly also even into Facebook, and we can explore this more together. It's good to see uh, so many regulars, um, people who uh, we also meet um, on our Zoom sessions. So every Wednesday after these YouTube uh, sessions, we'll go to um, Zoom and have a more interactive conversation and uh, yeah, it's a great way to spend Wednesday evenings, so. Yeah, uh, these six attributes or these six aspects of anatta, I had never seen this, this list before. Um, Pia Payuta does an amazing job throughout Buddha Dhamma of really um, synthesizing and pulling together uh, disparate um, aspects and different manifestations of a concept um, that appear throughout the canon. So as um, many people know, the Pali canon is, is quite vast. You know, you've got, uh, if you have a, a bookshelf that's about this big, so it's a bit bigger than my head, and you had uh, maybe eight shelves of that, then uh, that would be the Pali canon, usually about 40 or 42 volumes. Um, so thousands of pages, and um, it's not always, the Buddha didn't always um, organize his thought 
you know, didn't always pull together uh, everything he ever said on feeling. The Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses, um, really uh, does that. It's, it's called the connected discourses because it, it pulls different things together. So like there's a category on feeling, there's a category or a Sangyutta on um, teachings to uh, devas, teachings to bhikkhunis, to nuns, teachings to uh, monks, to brahmins, teachings on the sixth sense field, on the eightfold path, etc. But what P.A. Paiuto does is just bring these things together. So he's found these six different aspects and pulled them into one place. And I think it's quite useful because um, yeah, some of this on one level it might, when you read it, it might feel like theory, but each one of these really is just, a, or it, it can be a key kind of unlocking, um, yeah, some things which we might not otherwise understand. And anatta is certainly one of those things. So just a reflection, yeah, seeing myself as a cloud body brought tears to my eyes and to my heart. Yeah, it's beautiful. I actually had the same experience uh, this morning of, uh, yeah, actually tearing up at, um, at the felt sense of this. So um, the perception and the um, felt, felt sense. So, and yeah, tears can be a manifestation of piti or of, uh, of joy or even rapture. Our next question is, does the Pali Canon refer to the cloud body? Thank you. Um, it does not. It does not. Um, I think there are suttas which uh, speak about um, clouds, using clouds as metaphors. Um, and certainly in the, uh, the Mahayana canon and the Tibetan canon, you see this uh, simile of, um, you know, they have a slightly different formulation, but basically like the sky, the blue sky being um, Buddha nature, or we could think of it as just a, a certain type of consciousness. And then clouds being um, like the passing form, feeling, perception, cognition, um, and sense consciousness. So uh, it's a good question. I, I, I actually was just kind of um, creating the term, I think I have heard Tibetan teachers perhaps use something similar. Um, but for me, it's just trying to name what it feels like from the inside when you open your, your mind up um, a bit, yeah, to the limits of, or to the perceived limits, what are the limits of, of the skin? What are the limits of uh, what I can, can feel outwardly? And it feels more like a cloud than a, a shell or a, you know, a peanut or a, you know, tennis ball, you know, you don't, I don't feel the body as if I was a, a ping pong ball. Yeah, I can't reach the, you know, huge limit. It seems like if, if mind was enclosed inside the body, wouldn't I be able to like touch the limits of the, the outer skin or something? Couldn't I feel that? But it doesn't feel like that. It's like a ping pong ball made of cloud, basically. The more I feel it, I don't want to stay in this world. I hope that's coming from a, uh, a healthy and happy place uh, in terms of not wanting to continue in samsara and not not coming from some place of uh, yeah uh, thinking about any kind of um, yeah wanting to end this body because we're we're with it for the rest of our lives so having a, a healthy relationship with the body is a, a good thing. Um, but yeah, that's how devas are, are talked about, is basically living in the clouds. Actually, there's a whole Sangyutta called the Valaka Sutta, which is all about cloud devas. I think it's number like 28 or 38 or something, the cloud devas. And um, the Buddha doesn't exactly describe what these beings are, but yeah, maybe it's devas who live in a cloud body. So our next question is, when I consider when is the body, I think of the self that arises from dependent origination. It is not permanent, but does not arise from conditions. 
and we can be both held by it and hold to it, hold it too. Oops, yeah, and just a correction. Uh, it should be when is self. So when I consider when is the self, when is the self, I think of a self that arises from dependent origination. It is not permanent. but does arise from conditions and we can b be both held by it and hold to it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great um, and healthy way, in a balanced way, of course, to, to look at this. And um, yeah, I don't think that I would recommend this, this cloud body meditation or um, yeah, really exploring certainly disembodied types of meditations to um, yeah, I don't at all think that the person who's asking this question is uh, in this category. But um, yeah, to feel disembodied, the mind can go in that direction. But um, if one doesn't have like a healthy, a healthy ego, basically, then it can it can feel um, very unsettling. So, um, but I think m m um, connecting it, melding it with the body. Um, you know, does help keep things balanced and kind of, as you're saying here, Mary, this, uh, yeah, there's the element of, yeah, being both held by it and holding on to it and, and trying to do both of those as skillfully as possible. Um, yeah, and paying on when, when is the self, yeah. Um, seeing where, if it did exist, where might it manifest right now? So that when kind of bleeds into where. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Thinking of kindness of the Buddha brings tears to me. Yeah, uh, I feel the same way. And um, yeah, I'll be interested. Maybe for our Zoom session, we can talk more about this this cloud body. Uh, great. So um, maybe this is Tan Nisibo who's put a, a link here to the Valahaka Sangyuta on cloud devas. Thank you. Uh, if that's Tan Nisibo. Um, but yeah, the experiencing the body in this way, like feeling the um, seemingly bound, boundless nature while embodied, it, it's a great meditative place to start from. And you can bring many different meditation objects into it. Um, this, um, there's this reflection right here about uh, both the Buddhas the Buddha and kindness and the kindness of the Buddha. So from this cloud body, one can also practice either Buddhanusati, recollection of the Buddha, or uh, metta, uh, metta bhavana, so uh, practice of metta. And this, uh, this pool, this, this uh, wave field, this, um, yeah, <laughs> this experiential, perceptual, uh, cognitive um, consciousness field, you know, which feels like shimmering light, you can, it's a beautiful place from which to practice metta and to experience and conceive of, of the Buddha as well and to have that be inspiring. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I'll be curious if, if um, this description of the the, the cloud body makes makes sense to people. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a combination of a number of different um, teachers' uh, recommendations for uh, for meditation. Um, so we've got uh, yeah the whole body uh, practice again recommended by uh, many great Thai forest ajans. Um, Ajahn Mahabua was famous for saying that you could just take this whole body as you know, the, the inner felt sense of it as your playground and just play in this whole body experience, knowing the whole body. Um, so yeah, we can, we can do that. So that has a precedence uh, in this kind of playing with the, the seeming barriers or the seeming uh, outlines of the felt sense of the body uh, has a precedence in um, in 
Dzogchen meditation where you're really um, yeah, trying to look out and look in at the same time and uh, really drop awareness from behind the eyes. So from this kind of cognitive brain-based self that we feel like we're operating from a lot of the time, down, lower, and then to experiment with uh, knowing inside and outside of the body. And similarly in the Shurangama Sutra, a Mahayana text, uh, there are some fascinating meditative exercises of, uh, you know, in, it's phrased as the Buddha talking with Ananda, and the Buddha asking him, where is the mind? And Ananda kind of coming with all these propositions of, oh, the mind is inside the body, and the Buddha giving uh, a good rebuttal for why that couldn't be the case. Okay, the mind is outside the bottle, the body. Okay, the mind is in between. Okay, the mind is inside the eyeballs. Okay, the mind is inside, both inside and outside the body. Um, so there's precedence there. There's also precedence in the um, Satipatthana Sutta. So in what's called the refrain, uh, we've got um, the Buddha talking about knowing the body internally and knowing the body externally, knowing the body both internally and externally. And the same with uh, feelings, the mind, and dhammas. So this liminal, liminal body could be another place, another name for it because it's right at this intersection of um, yeah, self and world, body and air, etc. So reflection. So when I see in this world, I meant in this samsara where everything is passing away, nothing is solid enough to hold on to. Yeah. Very true, yeah, thank you for um, clarifying that, Wandana. Yeah, and um, yeah, there's certainly many places where um, in the Pali Canon, the Buddha would recommend for, um, for monastics and for lay people who were um, coming from a mature place, coming from a, um, yeah, a solid and a healthy place to reflect on just that, the, um, the danger of samsara, that nothing seems substantial um, and everything is just crumbling away. This is, last week, um, someone had brought up a question about uh, investigative or analytical meditations. And in the Tibetan tradition, um, the Lam Rim, which is perhaps the most uh, analytical, um, semi-canonical text that uh, people practice with, um, that is, yeah, it starts off with analytical or thought, you know, thinking about uh, samsara, thinking about uh, the dangers of samsara and the dangers of, of being reborn. So, um, and if people are coming from a, a belief in, in other realms, in, in rebirth, then that's, uh, a smart teaching to pay attention to. It it fits into uh, the whole uh, perspective of the Buddha of, um, yeah, that this is, from this perspective, a could be a multi-life uh, practice. And um, this human life, we've got it pretty good, but uh, there are other realms. There's animal realms. And uh, yeah, I've got some family members we... I think they're the ones who bring it up, but they'll say, oh yeah, you know, if, if I was to get reborn, they kind of ask the question over dinner or something while I'm sitting there not having dinner because um, I'm a monk and I don't eat dinner, but over dinner, yeah. So what would you be if you had to be reborn and people going around giving answers, which as a monk who kind of, you know, believes in rebirth, like, I don't know, do you really, you know, people saying, I want to be a dog, I want to be a turtle. Like, really? I mean, it would be, yeah, I mean, it might be okay if you were reborn as a dog in America in a wealthy family, um, but do you want to be reborn as a dog in, yeah, think about it before you, um, yeah, kind of make more intentions in that direction. But yeah, so I think that we'll call that uh, an evening for, at least for YouTube, and we'll switch over to Zoom now. So it's been great seeing everyone, and we'll be back again next Wednesday, and uh, next Wednesday, Tanisabo and I both will actually be um, having a conversation together. So those are always fun. And Tanisabo will be live at uh, St. Mark's as usual. 
And you can, of course, if you're in Seattle, always uh, offer alms to Tan Nisabo in the mornings from about 7.05 to 7.40 at Pike Place Market outside of La Pioneer Bakery. So wish everybody well and hopefully see people on Zoom. You can find the link in um, at our website, clearmountainmonastery.org, and uh, just go to uh, the calendar and then you'll find today and then click on the Zoom link. So take care, everybody. It's uh, great talking and reflecting on Dhamma with all of you.